All right. Good morning, church. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. Anybody glad you be in the house this morning? Yeah. Hey, it's never been a, it's never been a better time to be a part of, of God's church, the Big C Church, and then specifically Rescue House. I mean, what God is doing here is is unbelievable. Our church is growing uh, in many ways, not just numerically, uh, but he, his hand of favor really is on us uh, this season, and I'm just excited to be a part of it. Uh, I'm excited to see your smiling faces this morning. I'm excited about the word that we have. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, last weekend in Kids House, we had 144 kids back in Kids House. Can we just celebrate that? <clears throat> Um, on Wednesday nights with our youth, we're averaging over 60 students every week. Uh, a few weeks back, uh, we had 92 students. Um, and so God is just moving in, uh, again, in a powerful way. Uh, the lady that just led you in that last song, she's a part of our Rise Up ministry. She's a part of the Rise Up worship team. She's 16 years old, uh, leading us in worship. And I thought, did she do a phenomenal job? Her name's Salem. Come on, give Salem a round of applause. Pretty cool. And so around here, we don't just, you know, just have, a, you know, a next generation ministry. We are a next generation ministry, passing the baton of the church uh, to them. And you're a part of that when you give, when you serve, when you're a part, when you're connected. And so I just wanted to celebrate that and give Jesus all the praise and all the glory. Like I said, it's never been a, a better time to be a part of what God's doing here. And next weekend, we have the weekender. This is where, when I give you the challenge of, hey, give us a year of your life, what I'm asking you is to take us up on all that we have to offer. In other words, figure out what, well, you know, what is Rescue House's vision? Where have we been? Where are we? Where are we going? How do you fit into that? And it's at the weekender that you find all of that stuff out. I get to have an intimate session with you Friday night, answer any questions you have, cast some vision for you, catch you up to speed again on where we've been, what we're doing, and where we're going, and again, how you fit into that. And so if you have not uh, signed up for the weekend, or if you haven't been there, if you're not connected, and what I mean by connected is more than just filling in a row on Sunday mornings. It's got to go, you got to go deeper than that. If you want to grow spiritually, uh, you got to get rooted, you got to get connected. And the Bible is very clear that those who are rooted in the house of the Lord, uh, their, their life, their family will flourish. It's not that you won't have bad times here and there, have some trouble, but your life overall is going to be blessed by God, anointed by God, and you're, you're going to flourish in the courts of your God, okay? So I want to encourage you to sign up for the weekend, or you can do that on the app. Now, I'm excited about this message today, not because it's the topic and the assignment that I have, but I truly believe that this message is going to be so protective uh, for many of you, your future marriages, your future families. Uh, we are in a series, if you didn't know, on the, on the Ten Commandments, and we're just going through them one by one. Uh, these are the ten laws that God gave to Moses, and uh, he gave to the the people of Israel, God's children. And today, we're going to talk about the seventh commandment, which says, do not commit adultery. Exodus 20, 14 says it. This is where we find our commandment. He says, you shall not commit adultery. Now listen, I know that this subject can be very sensitive. For a lot of us in the room, uh, this law that's been broken, this sin that's been committed, um, has affected many of our families, whether it's something we committed on our own, or we were on the receiving end of that, or our parents, or our grandparents, or aunts, or uncles, or even just friends. I mean, th this sin can really affect a sphere of people, a circle of people. And so I'm just going to ask you for grace up front as we talk about this subject from God's word. I understand that this may bring up, you know, things from the past or, um, you know, um, emotions that maybe you thought, you know, you had buried. And uh, I just want you to know that if you haven't already, like if this is a sin that you've committed, if you haven't already, the heart behind this is for you to receive the grace and forgiveness that God has for you. You do not have to continue to walk in shame and condemnation. I'm telling you, uh, you can draw a line in the sand with your repentant heart where you can put that past behind you and walk in a newness of life because his mercies are made new every morning. Is anybody grateful for the mercy of God that renews? News every 24 
hours. And so I just want everybody in here who this may have affected to receive the grace that is for you, that God has extended to me, that God has extended to you. Um, and then rather than just kind of giving disclaimers, you know, after every section of the sermon, I just, I need you up front, listen to me, to trust my heart um, and just know that my heart is not to bring up or conjure up shame and condemnation for you. It's for you to receive uh, the grace and forgiveness of God and then to protect future families from enduring this pain. That is the goal of today. Um, also, just last disclaimer for the day, um, I know there are some younger kids in here, um, and we are going to be talking about some adult stuff, and so if you want to remain in here, that's fine. This might teeter a little bit on some rated R stuff that are for adults only, but it's from the Bible and stuff that we need to address in the church, and so you just need to be prepared to have a conversation um, after um, this sermon if you decide to kind of stay in here. There was a church, it was kind of in a rural area, a small church of about 50 people, and uh, this preacher got up and he talked about adultery. And, you know, this is the time when, you know, Little Baptist Church and, all, you know, all the kids were in there and, um, you know, everybody was listening and this pastor was talking about adultery. Well, after, you know, words, they went to lunch and they, um, you know, began to have conversations. And, you know, again, it was rural area, a bunch of farmers and the son said, hey, dad, what is agriculture?" <laughs> and the father just said, son, it means don't plow in another man's field. That's what that means right there. And uh, I thought that that was a pretty good definition. Um, and so in this sermon, uh, we're going to be talking about adultery. Other words that come up are fornication. Uh, they come from the same Greek word, porneia. All right, now the word porneia is where we get the word pornography, um, and this is where we get sexual immorality. Uh, this is kind of a catch-all term for sexual sin, sexual activity between partners, male and female, who are not married. And so this would obviously be like looking at porn or, you know, uh, watching graphic sex scenes, TV mature, and it kind of crosses lines and boundaries. It could even get into reading graphic, you know, sex romance novels, you know, teetering on things like Fifty Shades of Grey, and we're just in it, and we're just like, you know, it begins to conjure up a desire within us. And you might say, well, that's not porn, but it's porneia, and that's what the, the, the Bible's definition of it in the sexual immorality in God's eyes. Um, adultery, obviously, admittedly, is a little bit more serious. Um, it's voluntary sex between a married person and a partner other than your lawful spouse. The reasons why adultery are wrong, I have two of them for you. One is it destroys families and ultimately destroys societies. You've got to understand that family is the fabric to society. It is the foundation of society. And the enemy knows this. Satan knows this, which is why he's coming after your marriage. Because if he can come after your marriage and break that apart, create division, then it affects the kids. Then it affects generations, their children's children. And, and, and it's just the enemy knows that if he can come after your marriage, if he can come after your family, that that's going to begin to break the, the fabric and foundation of society. Because when the family is strong, the church is strong. When the church is strong, society is strong. And so that's why it's very important to me uh, that, that, that family is one of our legacy lanes. We, we pour so much into the family, and that's why we have brotherhood and sisterhood that meets on Thursdays. We're pouring into the men, pouring into the women. We're pouring into marriages and parenting and our next generation ministries. We are a family-oriented church, and we believe in investing in uh, families in order to make them strong because that is really the backbone. That is how God designed it in his word to pass the baton of Jesus' gospel to the next generation. Number two reason why it's adultery is wrong is because it violates a covenant promise. Marriage is a covenant relationship. There's really only kind of like three covenant relationships. This is like the highest form of relationship. The first covenant relationship is between you and God. The second one is between you and your spouse. And the third one kind of talks about uh, your relationship with the church, 
And so those are covenant relationships that we don't just like kind of just like bow out when things get hard or we just kind of like, oh, I got offended here, so I'm out. Like, no, you're in a covenant committed relationship and adultery uh, violates that covenant promise. Um, and, and you got to understand that um, this is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church, between God and mankind. God says, I'm going to keep loving you even when you mess up. I'm going to keep pursuing you even though you're not pursuing me. That's a covenant relationship. I want you to think about the traditional marriage vows, all right? I'm just going to kind of read them to you. This is kind of tradition. Maybe some of you did your own vows and put them in your own words, and that's totally cool. But the traditional ones kind of sound like this. It's, I take you to be my lawful wedded husband or wife. In other other words, under the law, not just the law of the lamb, but the law of the Lord, uh, to have and to hold. In other words, you're coming together for better or for worse in the good times and in the bad, for richer or for poorer, so it doesn't matter, you know, the finances, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, and then here's the adultery part, forsaking all others, and then I love this last part, according to God's holy law. I like that part because it's God who came up with the idea of marriage, and so God sets the standard of love. But sometimes we try to come up with the standard of love, and God's standard is until death do us part in the good times and in the bad. And adultery is wrong because it breaks and violates that covenant promise. Here's why this is a big deal. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covets, nor drunkards, nor uh, rivalers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, and such were some of you, but, anybody thankful for this but right here, right? This is a big but right here, or big but. <laughs> you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And so what he's saying is, you know, none of these people that persist in these types of behaviors, these types of sin, if you just continue to live, you're unrepentant, and you just kind of keep rolling the way that you want to roll in your own way, those people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But the people that repent, like we all were one of these things at some point. But if we are repentant and we walk in a newness of life and we walk in the righteousness of God, then we will have um, eternal life with our Heavenly Father. You know, State Farm Insurance Company put out uh, that 31,000 deer in West Virginia alone. So West Virginia alone, 31,000 deer were hit by cars last year. A high percentage of them were actually in the fall, and you've heard of deer hunting season. Um, well, the insurance companies have deer hitting season, and this happens in the fall. I brought a, a picture for you today, and uh, the, you should have seen the pictures I could have chosen, so don't judge me, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> Let me ask you something. What's going on in the fall with these deer? They looking for love, all right? <laughs> It is mating season, all right? And love is in the air, and their hormones are going crazy and swirling, and the bucks start fighting each other for the does, and the bucks are chasing the does. And basically, these deer, they have a one-track mind. And they get so focused on what they want that they don't even care to see the semi-truck barreling down the road. The boom! And their one-track mind led to their death. I think this is a pretty good illustration. (laughs) A powerful illustration. On a serious note, I've seen so many who are married. I've counseled many who are married who think that they are in love with someone else, but they're actually in lust with somebody else. And they'll say things like, oh, well, this person just gets me, or 
this person just makes me happy, or they just make me feel so good, or I can't, just, I can't stop thinking about him, and she really understands me, and oh, she looks so good, and they go chasing this thing that they think is going to give them pleasure and satisfaction, that they don't even see the danger that's barreling down the road that's going to run over them and cause, you know, a, an extreme amount level of pain and brokenness for everyone involved. And you might get a few moments of pleasure, but eventually you're gonna end up like that deer on the side of the road and it's gonna lead to your death. You're gonna be in all kinds of trouble. You're gonna end up in divorce court. You're gonna lose a lot of your money, resources. And, and worst of all, more than just that, you're gonna, you're gonna inherit decades of kids who resent you for breaking up your family. Can I just tell you today and give you a warning? It's not worth it. Right. It's not. Proverbs 6, 32 says, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. One translation actually says he hates himself. Studies have actually shown that adultery can lead to severe mental illness and disorders for those who commit it and for those who are cheated on. It can cause PTSD type symptoms um, and an increased uh, risk of heart attack, which often leads to divorce. And the Journal of Men's Health said this, the mortality rate for divorced men, check it out, is 250% greater than married men. It's literally like taking years off of your life. Same studies show that for women who are divorced, it's a 24% more likely to have a heart attack. After the second divorce, that number goes up to 77% more likely to have a heart attack. And obviously, there are devastating effects for kids as well. And then once somebody strays away from their spouse, you know what they do? They stray away from God. And they stray away from the church because they're, you know, they had an affair, they're embarrassed, and and the relationship with God falls apart, and then they're far from God, and it all started because they had a desire for someone who was not their spouse. Now, just like last week, Jesus comes along, and he elevates the standard, and he reveals God's heart, and he says this in Matthew 5, 27 and 28. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I just need to be very clear that when you commit adultery uh, physically, that is different than committing adultery in your heart. Nonetheless, they are both sinful before God, but they do have different earthly consequences. While both are wrong, uh, they are not the same Thing. Let's break down the word lustful, or the two words lustful, intent, all right? This means to desire. This does not mean that you, you know, can't look at somebody, or you notice somebody, or you're observant, or, you know, you notice that someone is attractive. It is not a sin to notice that someone is beautiful or good-looking. Uh, that does not mean that you are guilty of lust. Again, it just means that you are observant. It's not noticing that is lust. It's when lust turns into wanting or desiring, all right? This reminds me of my late nighttime routine of going to the pantry and looking in and deciding, am I going to eat this bowl of cinnamon toast crunch or not? All right, and this is how this routine works, and this is just about every night. I go in, and I just open up the pantry, and I know what the pantry looks like, and I'm just looking at this cinnamon toast crunch, and I'm going, is it worth it tonight, okay? Like, I didn't have it last night, and like, you know, I feel like a little slimmer right now, and I'm feeling good about myself. Maybe I went for a run, and I, and no, no, be good, Matt, be good, and I'll, you know, shut the pantry, and I'll go, and I'll maybe throw something away. I'll maybe do a dish, and then I get that thought again, and um, go back to the pantry, and I open it up. And anybody else? Am I alone in this? Right? Like, and uh, and the more that I look at it, come on, somebody, the more I want it, <laughs> the more I desire it. And so the first look, the second look is is it's not like it's a sin, but you got to understand that looking turns into desiring. Desiring turns into wanting, wanting turns into doing. 
And that's how the enemy gets you in this sin. It's a slow fade. And it starts small and it begins to grow. And that's why you gotta have bouncy eyes. Like you see something, you're like, mm, I'm bouncing. <laughs> bouncy eyes. <All> right. <laughs> you see somebody, just bounce them. All right? It's a real mature sermon today. Right? <laughs> So Jesus comes along and he says, hey, if you even look with, with, with lust in your heart, you have that intent, that desire, that want, and you think about it and ruminate on it, then that's when it crosses over into sin. Now, you need to understand that people who fall into adultery didn't make a bad choice. They made a series of bad choices. So, so somebody who, you know, somebody doesn't just like trip up into the sin of adultery, like, oh, I don't know how we got here. <laughs> Ooh, I made a mistake. Now you didn't make a mistake. You made a series of mistakes that led you to that moment. And, you know, anyone who has, you know, cheated physically probably has been cheating mentally for months, maybe years. Again, it's, it's a process. And so I want to talk, spend the rest of my time, 14 minutes, 38 seconds, talking about the path that is, that is paved with bad choices. I want to talk the, about the path to adultery. And this is where I want to be preemptive. This is where I want to be, help you with, uh, notice some warning signs. And Lauren and I, we are very tight on some of these things where we, we've talked about them, we've communicated on them, so that we make sure that we're protecting our marriage. Because like even, you know, uh, there are a lot of pastors that have moral failures, and I'm very hypersensitive to that. I do not want to be one of those. And I'm not one of these that's like, I'll never, that'll never happen to me. No, I'm like, man, this could happen to me. I've told Lauren that, and I say, I don't want this to happen. I want, you know, and so we come up with boundaries, and we come up, you know, that work for us to make sure that we don't even have a hint of sexual immorality. We don't even have a hint of adultery, and it doesn't even get started, okay? So I just want to help you with that. Let's talk about the path to adultery, and we'll bring some, some things to the surface. The first one is a lack of love and romance. So oftentimes people end up committing adultery because they're longing for love and affirmation and encouragement and, and charity and, um, you know, are, are you, if, if you're getting married, are you, are, are you getting the encouragement um, are you getting the affirmation and the appreciation from your spouse that you need? And if you're not, you need to be bold enough to just have a conversation and say, hey, this is a part, something that I need uh, you to serve me in. I'll serve you um, and we'll serve one another, all right? What we don't want is you walking around desperate uh, to get that from anyone that, you know, you'll receive a word of praise from just anyone. Um, we... we you need to have a conversation. The greatest marriages are constantly expressing love and encouragement, and they're filling one another up, and so that way they're already full, so when they go to work and, you know, somebody from the break room or somebody from, you know, a coworker tries to fill that cup for you, you, like, don't receive it because you're already full. You know, men, when somebody at work tells your wife that she's pretty, her response is, yeah, I know, because my husband tells me all the time. He's already told me a couple times today. He's texted me. He's let me know, and her cup is already full from appreciation, from your love, from your romance, that she doesn't desire that, he doesn't desire that from, from anyone else. You know, for guys, you know, it really is, they'll never admit it, I'll admit it for us all, it is, is a, you know, usually a lack of appreciation. Um, you know, ladies, honestly, sometimes you'll notice a lot of the things that <clears throat> we men do wrong, and then really don't appreciate sometimes the things that we do right. Come on, we get some things right, Amen. And so women will oftentimes say, you know, why is he like that? That's not the man that I married. Um, you know, why can't he be more like the guy from the notebook? You know, like, just like, <laughs> is that Ryan Gosling? Is that who that is? Like, and then, you know, for, for the wife, it's like, you know, or, uh, or, you know, he goes to work and, and his eyes are wondering and maybe he starts to think things like, you know, why can't, you know, my wife be more like this girl and uh, appreciate me and tell me how awesome I am and how successful I am and how I crushed it at work this week and she respects me and, 
It's like, of course she respects you because she didn't have to like wash your underwear and she didn't have to like <laughs> wake up beside of you and your bad breath and you think she's like beautiful because you didn't see what she looked like that morning, right? And like the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Uh, the grass is greener where you water it and you need to make sure that you are taking care of your own well. At the end of the day, you can run off with another man or a woman, but what you'll quickly find out is that they have their own blemishes, they have their own faults, and if they're willing to cheat on their spouse with you, they're probably willing to cheat on you at some point. All right, number two, path to adultery is a shortage of consistent sex. I see this all the time. Um, I have never heard of a couple getting a divorce because they were engaging in too much sex with one another. Never, I've never heard that. But I have heard the opposite, and I've heard the opposite a lot. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says this, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. So the only time you should not be really having sex is when you both agree and you're agreeing to kind of fast from it so that you can seek the Lord in prayer. He said, then you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. How I look at this and how Lauren looks at this as well is this is kind of like an open door policy within our marriage that if one is desiring uh, to have sex, that you try to do your best to come together and meet that need, all right? The only time that you shouldn't is when both of you um, disagree. Now, this is not a license for abuse. It's really a license for use because God came up with it and you should enjoy it and it should be pleasurable. And are there times where, you know, uh, the woman has a headache? Yeah, sure, you have a headache. Um, <laughs> Y'all got to come up with a better excuse, though. I'm going to tell you, all right? That was good. That, was, that, wasn't, that wasn't in my notes. That was. And so, uh, yeah, what my point is, that if someone is obviously sick or you know, unhealthy or whatever, we don't just abuse that um, in any way. Um, sex should never be about abuse. It should be about serving one another. The, the biggest question I get in counseling sessions with married couples who have been married for years, um, you know, premarital counseling, is you know, how often should we have sex? And the Bible's not specific about that, I would just say that it needs to be regular and it needs to be consistent so that Satan will not tempt you, all right? Uh, now, this is not biblical advice. This is Pastor Matt advice, all right? Y'all ready for this, all right? I believe that uh, when it comes to a number, at minimum, this is like bare minimum, if you're healthy and, you know, um, that at minimum it should be once a week. That's the bare minimum, though. I, I think, you know, you go to church once a week, uh, you rest in the Sabbath once a week. <laughs> at the very minimum, you should have sex once a week. That's where my brain goes. That is not biblical, just for the record. Please don't email me after this message. Please don't. Just give me grace. I ask for grace on this one. We'll move on to next week uh, in just a minute. But I really believe that you should. I get, I get really concerned when I counsel couples and they say it's been months. Uh, that, that's very dangerous, honestly. Um, and, and it allows the enemy to get a, a foothold and you become more like glorified roommates. Um, again, it needs to be regular and consistent. In my opinion, it needs to be a good amount more than once a week. You, got, you figure that out. You, um, you can schedule it. You can do whatever you want to do. But... Um, you need to make sure it's regular and consistent so that the, the enemy doesn't you know, get a foothold. Now, we don't wanna just have sex just to avoid adultery, all right? That's called like duty sex, like it's my duty. I, gotta, I guess I gotta do it. Like, no, we don't wanna have that talk either, all right? Um, again, we want to engage in this because this is God-ordained, all right? 
This, you gotta understand that we, when we're talking about this, most churches won't talk about this, but this is what the Lord came up with. You understand that it was his mind that brought this together in the covenant of marriage, and it is a very beautiful thing. And the reason why we laugh sometimes and why I might get an email or whatever and it's too far or whatever is because the, the enemy has taken what was beautiful and the Lord put together and he spun it for dirty and he took a gift that he gave to his children and the enemy's taken it and the world has taken it and run with it and we've got to redeem it and in order to redeem it we got to talk about it and so that's what I'm trying to do uh, today but when you when you engage in sex with uh, anyone it releases oxytocin to your brain and bonds you chemically to that person that you're having sex with. It's why it's a bad idea and it's sinful to have sex with someone who are you are not lawfully in that covenant relationship with. Again, it was God's idea between a husband and a wife, and it's beautiful. And I, I just wanna give this disclaimer right here. A lack of sex is not an excuse to commit adultery. It's not. But it's just, I'm just telling you, I'm trying to help you uh, see the warning signs of path to adultery. Number three is misplaced emotional intimacy. This is, a, this is something we need to recognize that emotional intimacy is something everyone needs. You need to, you know, everyone needs to be seen, everyone needs to be known. God wired you that way. Um, and you don't need just physical intimacy, you need emotional intimacy. Uh, most physical affairs start as emotional affairs. And then they grow as people confide in one another. And here's just some words of advice. And this is just, you take it, you can leave it, you can eat the fish, leave the bones, however you want. But for me, I think it like this. I have no business saying anything negative about my marriage to anyone of the opposite sex ever, right. ever. Um, I have no business spending time alone with anyone of the opposite sex alone in a confined place, not a work lunch, not carpooling uh, regularly together. It's very, you gotta understand, it's very difficult for people to spend a lot of time together without at least one of them kind of forming some type of emotional uh, intimacy. And I would never share my hopes and dreams or my desires or my disappointments with anyone of the opposite sex. God gave me someone to share that with, and that's Lauren, and that's who I'm going to confide in when it comes to that. Now, can you have friends of the opposite sex? Yes, for sure, but there's, there's boundaries uh, to that. Again, Proverbs 5.15 says, drink water from your own well, and this is talking about in the covenant of marriage. Number four uh, is too much privacy and individuality. Okay, so this is where the couple gets married, but they still want to be an individual, and they still want to have privacy, and they want things, they want to hide, they want to have secrets, um, and it's just a little bit weird to me that how some people who are married, you know, they want privacy and boundaries where it's not healthy to have it, or they see themselves as two individuals who live together, maybe they sleep together, but they have different lives and different goals, and but in a marriage, two become one. Matthew 19, 6 says, since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. This is the only relationship where two people spiritually become one. You do not become one with your parents. You do not become one with your children. The only person you can become one with is your spouse, lawfully in a covenant relationship with them under God's holy law. So when you're one, it is wise to act like one, to have one budget, to have one bank account, to have one purpose, one parenting philosophy. It's important for you to get on the same page with that. Me and Lauren, we share everything, okay? She knows all my logins. She knows all my passcodes. Like, she gets on my phone, she knows my passcode, she can get it. She's welcome to check that phone at any point in time. She can see all the text message threads. She can see whatever. I mean, she can do whatever she wants, and I will not think she's crazy because we are one. My phone is her phone, and we are united together with two holy iPhones. <laughs> We are not a house divided. We are not, we do not have one Android and one iPhone. That is not of the Lord. And we will open the altar for you to repent if that's your situation. Obviously, I'm joking. 
Disclaimer, got to put those in there. We share everything, um, and we are complete oneness. Now, this doesn't mean that you got to be like, spending 24 seven together and like walking around like one, like, you know, it just means that when you are apart and he might have his friends go play golf or fish or she might, you know, wanna do her things with her, her friends. And um, it's just when you're apart, you're on the same page. That's what that means. Number five, and the last one is little compromises that lead to bigger compromises. Okay, so little compromises mean like, you know, receiving a DM from somebody else or a Facebook message and, you know, a Facebook message turns into a lunch outing, which then becomes reality, and you end up in a motel room, and you're wondering how you got here, and it started with a simple message that you responded to that you had no business even responding to, because adultery, again, is not just a mistake. It's not like, man, how did I get here? It's accumulation of, of, of several little compromises that lead up to the sin. Hebrews 13.4 says, let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexual immoral, immoral and the adulterous. And so these words right here, let the marriage be bed be undefiled, it just means to let it be pure between you and your spouse, mentally and physically. And it means to keep the contaminants out. No one belongs in your marriage bed except for the person you are married to, again, physically or mentally, and Jesus, again, we'll read it again, comes along, elevates the standard, and he says this, you have heard it said that uh, you shall not commit adultery, but I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so uh, the heart of the matter is, it's a matter of the heart. And so you gotta guard your heart. Now I wanna end this sermon with some encouragement today. Um, because I know this can kind of bring up some angst, it can bring up some shame and condemnation or a feeling like, man, am I, you know, I've, you know, committed adultery, I've been on the receiving end of that and got divorced and then I got remarried and now I'm in a new marriage and does that mean I'm persisting in sin? And I wanna answer that question for us today uh, by using the example from David um, in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, David was on the rooftop one day, and he noticed Bathsheba on top of her roof, and she was bathing. And he looked, and he looked, and he looked, and he continued to look until that turned into a desire, and he went and he committed adultery with Bathsheba. She got pregnant to try to cover that up. He murdered um, her husband. Now, this is a man after God's own heart. That's how David is described. This is a godly man. So when I tell you, like, this is something that I could fall into, anybody could fall into it, like, if David fell into it, we all can fall into it. And so he had to try to cover it up, see how it just kind of sin just continues to build. It starts with a look, then it starts with a desire, then it starts with a, then adultery, and then that led to murder for David. And so David has her husband killed, and, and then God dealt with David severely for this. Here were some of the consequences in 2 Samuel. It says, but because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had been born to David, and he became ill. And on the seventh day, the child died. And so David begged for this child, for his child's life to be spared, and God did not spare his son's life. And on the seventh day, his his child died. David then goes into the temple and he confesses his sin to God. He repents. He says, God, I'm sorry. I, I, I turn from my sin. I, I'm walking a different way. I, I repent and I worship you. And then he goes on to say this. He says, but, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Or I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. And then check out what happens, the Bible says. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba. I mean, this is the same person that he had a, an affair with, killed her husband. And it says, and he went to lay with her, or went to her and, and lay with her. And she bore a son. And we know that from all scripture that all children are blessings from God. And he called his name Solomon. 
who was one of the Bible greats. And the Lord loved him. And so I've been asked several times, and there's been people in my family who I believe have been kind of told wrong. And it's like, well, if I, if I was married and then, you know, I, I divorced, whether it was for sexual immorality or not, or, you know, um, and, and, I, and I get married again, and then I realize what I did in my first marriage, there, there was sin there, and I, I repent of that sin. Do I need to, like, get divorced with my second spouse or my third spouse and like kind of go all the way back to my first spouse to get in right standing with God. And we know from this example that the answer to that is no, that you can receive Christ. If you repent, you can receive Christ's forgiveness right then and there. It's a line in the sand and you need to move forward in that covenant relationship that you are currently in. I want you to know that adultery is not the unpardonable sin. It is a sin that you can be forgiven of, redeemed of, and you can continue to walk in righteousness once you've repented of that sin and you've asked God for forgiveness. You know, there was a moment in the New Testament in John when Jesus had a moment with a lady who was caught in adultery. Like she was caught in the middle of adultery by the Pharisees. Can you imagine that? Like these Pharisees, they like walk into this house, they catch her in the middle of having adultery and they drag her out into the street and they try to get Jesus to condemn her. Just seconds ago, she's, I mean, she ain't even had time to repent. She hasn't even had time to say, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this was kind of something that maybe was a lifestyle for her. And in John 8, 10, 11, here's what happened when the Pharisees brought this woman, put her in a circle, and was asking Jesus, what do you, what do you, what do we do with, do we stone her? Like, what do we do? And you know the famous quote, right? Let those of you who have no sin cast the first stone. And then just one by one, their stones hit the ground and they begin to walk away. And you can just see that she's just on her knees probably. And she's just, she's not even like looking up and Jesus is just kind of waiting for everybody to fade. And Jesus says this right here. He says, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. And he says, go and sin no more. Like in the middle of this big sin, he doesn't condemn her. He loves her and he does have a message for her. In other words, Jesus offers grace to sinners, but grace isn't an excuse to keep on sinning. And so he doesn't let her off the hook and saying, I don't condemn you. He says, I don't, I don't condemn you, but you're gonna have to change moving forward. You're gonna have to repent. You're gonna have to do something different. And here's my message to you, go and sin no more. And for those of you that have been affected by this, that's what I would say to you. Repent, receive the grace that God has for you. And for everybody, no matter what situation or circumstance that you're in, no matter what law we've broken, go and sin no more. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. That you can even take our mess and turn it into a ministry. You can turn it into a testimony and you can use it for good even, even in our failures, God. You, you love us and you, you pursue us and you never turn your back on us, God. And God, I just ask right now for 
your grace and your salvation to fall on this place, that people would receive that right now. God, that they would draw a line in the sand, that they would repent of their sin and that they would move forward in a newness of, of life. As we're praying all over this location, here is the invitation today, is if you need to repent of this sin or any sin, I wanna give you one minute to do that by yourself. I'm not gonna help you with the words today. I just want you and the Lord just silently, I just want you to turn from your way. And tell God, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk in your way. I'm gonna give you one minute to repent of any sin you need to repent of. And then I'll come in in one minute and I'll close us in prayer. Go right now. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we repent, and we turn from our way to your way, God. We thank you for Jesus who redeemed us with the blood and his body that was broken for us. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory for loving us, redeeming us, and using us in spite of our sin. Um, and we just want you to know we love you, we're grateful, and we're gonna live for you, God, the best way we can for all the days of our life. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Thank you, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.